There are so many cold cases out there just waiting to be solved. The crime scene ultimately tells the story of the murder. We want to bring justice to these victims. Come on, sunshine. Knock, knock. Good morning. Hi. Eric Roberts. Eric Curley. Nice Eric to meet you. We yep. are very excited to have you here. This case has been something hanging around our neck since 1997. How many unsolved cold cases do y'all have? One. So if we get this one knocked out, y'all are good. Right the case is enormous. 16 binders, 5,000 pages in total. This is a small community. This is an unsolved murder. Uh, to say that it was uh, a black eye for the department would be an understatement. Why do y'all want us to call y'all all week? Eric, Eric and Eric. Eric. You can call me anything you like. <laughs> you can call you Yolanda anything you like, too. <laughs> Good morning, boys. Hello. It's great to see you. Great to see you. Oh. Hey, Steve. <laughs> Good you? to see you again. We're bringing back experienced investigator Steve Spingola, and for the first time, we're inviting Derek Bell, who we worked with on two different cases in Vigo County, Indiana, which resulted in arrests and a confession. I walked in the house, I grabbed the knife, I walked right over and I killed her. We turned Derek into a believer on how to solve cold cases. Did you ever see Erica like this? He knows how we put all of the little pieces together. I'm just racking my brain on this. And we are so excited to bring him on our team. This will be this six foot cord. It's extended as far as it'll go. It is such a cool thing to get to meet all of these bright, very talented investigators all over the country in these little towns. And now we can invite all of them to come work with us on all of our cases. Kind of like paying it forward. I have never seen a case researched to this degree. It's just incredible. I guess the what that sticks out the most is that, you know, two young boys found their mom. And uh, they were separated because they both had different dads. Lost their mom, but they kind of lost each other. They did. I mean, they have each other now. You know, for that scene to be found by two kids is... is yeah, it's pretty horrific. Is this a picture of Kim with her two sons? Uh, that had been a couple years prior to the event, yes. She was 38, right? Correct. Kim had just left her husband, Bob Steffen, uh, a couple months before she got in a relationship with uh, Dennis Young. This is a cool picture. Where'd you get that? From the family. Dennis Young, who also went by the name Denny, was a 55-year-old widower with several grown children. He lived in Greenville most of his life, and he was really well-known in the community. Dennis worked at a gas station as a manager. He was the type of guy, if you went in there every day, if you had cigarettes or whatever, he would have you rung up before and your cigarettes ready for you because he just knew everybody. So what do y'all want to put down for our date of murder? 23rd would be the death. 24th is a discovery. At Dennis's house? At Dennis's, yes. The two boys, they had not heard from their mom. They got a ride. They went to the house. They went to the back door, found a jar, walked in, and and then discovered the bodies. On the living room floor were Kim and Denny, both dead, with Kim resting on top of him with her hands still clutching his pants legs. Kim was shot three times in the torso area, puncturing lungs, liver, and kidneys. Mr. Young was shot twice. Later was determined it was by a 22. The firearm later on we determined was actually taken from the male victim. He had a gun cabinet. One of the most significant things when they were doing the crime scene is they found some significant afflictions upon the male victim. Ten deep incision wounds. Dennis was stabbed repeatedly in the neck. And while the gun that shot them was never recovered, the knife was found at the crime scene in the kitchen sink. But the only blood or DNA on the knife was Dennis's. So he was cut after he was shot, which is weird. Kim and Denny's last known whereabouts was at a place called Eagles Hall, a social club which they left about 1.30 in the morning. Because their bodies were discovered with their coats still on, the investigators always believed they were murdered as soon as they entered the house. The question is, by whom? Do y'all want to start putting what we have and what we do know on the board? All right. Robert, Bob, Stefan, intelligent. Yes, yes. he is. Major in smart. engineering. Bob and Kim were married in 1991. Kim and her two sons from previous marriages lived with Bob until 1996. She filed for divorce in October of 96. Even though her divorce wasn't quite final, Kim had already begun dating again. How about being jealous? Yes. Bob made some comments in passing to people about his displeasure of Denny being with Kim. 
Because of the divorce all by itself, Bob has a motive. What he doesn't have is an alibi. His movements that night are really hard to account for. He starts off with a date. He's done with the date by 8.30. Obviously, it's not too great of a date. The one time that Bob's whereabouts that night can be accounted for is during a blind date that had ended several hours earlier that night. That date had been set up by Bob's friend, Patty Burton. Talk about Patty Burton. Patty is from the Dayton area. She's a very, very rough character. She's out there. How do they know each other? She said that he worked on sinks and cabinets for her. Knows Bob as handyman and how else? Drinking buddy? Yes. How do you want to describe her? Erratic. Eccentric, erratic. Did she brag that she helped him with the murders? Right. Our witness says Patty said they deserved it because they're running around together. Right. Her only real connection to Kim was Bob, so we need to try and figure out whether or not she could have helped Bob or had a reason to do this on her own. She kind of puts herself right in the middle of it all. Okay, she's more of a unknown. Some people in town even suggested that Kim's sons might have been suspects. There has never been any evidence of that, and all that does is hurt our ability to try and find out who the real killer is. The clock is ticking, and it's time to get going. This case is unique because we're going to meet the family members of two different victims. Hi there. How are y'all? Good. Good. How are you? Good. Hi, Eric. Hey, how's it going? Going good. How old were you when your dad got murdered? 27. What was he like? He was wonderful. He was a good father, good husband, good grandpa. Um, he was my best friend. I mean, he... Sorry. He didn't deserve what he got. Summing up, he was about the best guy you'd ever want to meet in your life. He ran the Speedway gas station here in town, and people would just stop in every morning on the way to work just to see him. He'd give his last dime to a stranger. I miss him just like it was yesterday. There's just the two of you, two kids? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Talk about your mom. She wanted to get her degree to be an accountant and make good money to be able to support me and my brother, and she did one heck of a job doing it. Between her and Denny, they're the best people I've ever known. Now that I have two kids on my own, I get to see them not have a grandmother. You just got to do what you got to do to make it through life. I mean, I got my two beautiful girls, so I know my mom would want me to take care of them. How have you all gotten along, the two families? Well, we've seen these boys here for years, but, you know, we get along. Everybody's went their separate ways, so. It's kind of a calamity that throws your two families together. Yeah. Yeah, when you only got one thing to talk about that's bad, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's sometimes it's not good to be around. <laughs> the first people to discover the bodies that Monday morning were Jamie and Jackie, who had been staying with their aunt that weekend. Okay, so how do y'all find out what happened? Our uncle woke us up. He was getting ready to go to work, and he woke us up and said, your mom's not home yet. And I had called Denny's house on Sunday. It was ringing busy all day. Well, then when I called back again on Monday, it was still ringing busy, and that's when I was like, you know, something's not right. And I was like, just take us over to Denny's house. We parked on the street. I remember him saying that the door was locked, so I walked around back, and the back sliding glass is open about yeah. three inches or so, which was unusual, because Denny never left that door open. I walked in, and that's when I seen them both laying there on the floor. My mom was reaching out, grabbing onto Denny's pants like as she died. That is like a photographic memory. I remember all of it. Anyone can see that this crime has been devastating for the family. And from early on, Jamie and Jackie in particular have always thought that Bob's a potential suspect. I wanted to do my own vigilante justice, but Eric won't let me. It's pretty heartbreaking that you don't just have one family, but two devastated by this horrible crime. Patience, right. just a little bit. Okay, I'm so sorry. Very nice to meet you. Thank you guys. No, you're very welcome. It's been a long haul. We need to try and find the answers this week, not to just solve this case, but to try and heal and bring two different families together again.
We're in Greenville, Ohio, investigating the 1997 double murder of Kim Steffen and Dennis Young. The rumor around town that Kim's sons murdered their own mother and Dennis is outrageous and unfounded. I kind of thought maybe the boys were involved somehow because they seemed so unemotional about the whole thing. I don't know. I thought maybe that everybody was looking in the wrong direction. I've never really thought it was Bob Stephan. I've always thought that those boys had something to do with it. Okay. The younger one talking about how he wanted to blow Bob away. He has some anger then and he's got a lot of anger now. We still need to eliminate any possibility that two young boys could commit this murder. Re-examining the crime scene is going to offer up some clues to that. Kim and Denny were seen out at local bars on that Saturday, as late as 1.30 a.m. We believe they left together in Dennis's car to head back to Dennis's house. More than 24 hours later, they were found dead. We need to determine what happened inside that house and how our killer or our killers executed the crime. Morning. Hello, gentlemen. How's it going? Morning. Good, 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 good. You ready? What's up, Eric? How are you? Good. We know it all started yeah, in the back, so how about if we head back there? Sounds good. We're entering the rear of the residence where we know that the telephone box, the wires had been cut. One of the first unusual things discovered is that the phone wires on the outside of the house were deliberately cut, potentially before the killer even entered the house. They were cut here, both the telephone and the cable. It tells you whoever did this really thought out what they were going to do next and wanted to eliminate the possibility of anybody being able to call for help. We know that this back slider had been pried open. That's our point of entry. Are those hard to pry open? No. no. It's like you can pop them. It's one of the biggest point of entries in any burglary. Really? It's a slider. After the killer entered through the back door, they passed through a small den-type area into the hallway, passing the kitchen and the guest bedroom. This would have been the spare bedroom where the gun cabinet was located. The gun cabinet would have been right here. We do know that there was a firearm missing from that cabinet. You can't see that gun cabinet from here. No. Not unless you no go way. in the room where y'all are. A killer with this much premeditation usually isn't going to show up without a weapon. But a smart killer might have seen Dennis's guns and realized one of those would be untraceable to them. A 22 is not going to be as loud as a higher caliber gun. That may have been one of the reasons why he chose the 22 versus some other larger weapon. Now, one of the things that did happen in here, the person took the gun right out of the cabinet and literally just put it right into the pillow and did a test fire just to make sure it would even work. So there was a bed in that room with a pillow on it, and he just used that pillow? Correct. It had a bullet hole through it. And then right by you is your thermostat, which is also one of the things that we know was turned up to about 90 degrees. The temperature in a room can affect the decomposition rates of a body. So one theory to explain the temperature set on the thermostat is that our killer might have thought they knew enough about forensics, cranking the heat, thinking they would confuse investigators to the time of death. One of the first things that people did notice the minute they walked in the house was just the amount of heat going through here. Well, although it is winter time, 90's a bit hot. Now, if we move into this front area, okay. And this area here is where the, the bodies were discovered by Kim's boys. Denny would have been laying this way. Kim would have been laying this way, her head on his leg. While the medical examiner was not able to determine a specific time of death, the fact that both victims were found in the living room with their coats still on leads us to believe that they were shot upon entry after returning home Saturday night shortly after 1.30 in the morning. And if you add everything we know together, you can try to recreate potentially what happened that night. Logical place for our suspect to be is in the living room where he can watch through that window. Dennis and Kim come home. They park the car in the garage. They come through the laundry room, which leads into the living room. They still have their coats on. So now you guys walk in. Here comes our suspect around the corner. You're stunned. Dennis gets shot. Shot again. Collapses onto the dining room floor. Now, Kim. First shot. 
Second shot. The last shot. Your lungs have been hit, internal organs. You are filling up with blood. It's getting hard to breathe. You either choke or do a very hard cough. Blood goes onto this box and the plant. Now, Dennis is not deceased either, though. But now here's the deal. Our gun no longer has any cartridges left in it. It's a six shot. Our suspect goes to the kitchen where he gets a knife. Comes back where Dennis is lying on the ground right by the dining room table, cuts his throat, and then on the other side does a lot more stab type wounds. What you're not getting is you're not getting a lot of arterial spraying like you would get from cutting those major arteries. So that's telling you the heartbeat is really slowing down and so is the blood flow through your body. Which is why you think the gunshots happened first. Yeah. Okay, could be more forceful. So Kim crawls over to Dennis's leg where she rests her head on him and the last thing she does is actually get a pretty good grip on his pant leg. Suspect walks into the kitchen, puts the knife in the sink, rinses it off, walks by, turns the thermostat up to about 90 and left the residence, taking the revolver with him. The forensic evidence tested in this case, even the knife was inconclusive except for the victim's DNA. I've seen murders performed by children or teenagers. They're messy, they're rushed, and not so methodically planned. And here we have a crime where every single step, from entry to weapon to ambush to exit, were thought out and planned to perfection. This is not a murder committed by children. This is an intelligent and methodical murder. In 1997, Kim Stephens and Denny Young were ambushed and shot to death in Denny's home. Our goal is to try and piece together all of the events that led up to the murder. We're talking about that old 97 case. That's what it's about, the murder? Yeah. Beginning with the status of the relationship between Kim and Bob at that time. Hi, how you doing? This is Derek Phillips. There are over 90 people to talk to. With a cold case, you can read all the case file you want. All right, who lives here? Mr. John Thompson. Yeah. It's very important to be able to make contact with these people. Everything's just kind of words until you sit there face to face with somebody. Kim said he's crazy. She's scared to death of him. Did you hear that from someone else or did Kim I actually tell you that? Directly from her. She didn't like the way he treated the boys. She talked about the bruises and being slapped around. Kim filed a domestic violence report against Bob in October of 96, and we have witnesses who give us pretty good indication that Bob was violent. But how far would he have taken that abuse is the question. Hello. Hi, uh, this is Detective Roberts, Grimble Police. May I speak to Shane? You are? Shane was Kim's brother-in-law, and he also visited her in October of 96, right before she filed for divorce. Very miserable. She was just in real bad marital status. Okay. What did she tell you? She told us that she was leaving him. There's no way to patch things up, she said. And she wanted just to be as far away from him as possible. The following day, he accused her of screwing around on him. He's waving a gun around, telling her he's going to kill her and her kids if she leaves. That's what she told us directly. Okay. That they'd burn everything she, uh, she owned if she left that house. Okay. Did you hear that, or just Kim told you that? Kim told us that. Okay. Then he had the telephone wires unhooked from the home, disabled the car where she couldn't sneak out and get in the car, and said she couldn't have no contact with the outside world. Okay, how do you know that? Out of whose mouth did you get that information? She's restricted to the house. Kim. Okay, what'd she tell you? What'd she say? She said if we leave, he's going to kill her. Shane remembers pretty much everything uh, right off the top of his head, which to me is a good indication that he is being truthful. Shane, I can't thank you enough. Thanks. Thanks, Shane. Thank you. Look at this. All these things that he told us that are straight out of Kim's mouth that he can testify to, freaking fantastic. By all accounts, Kim was justified in fearing Bob after she filed for the divorce in 96. But we also need to try and figure out what Bob was thinking back then. Hey, are you Deanna? Yes. I'm Detective Eric Curl at Greenville Police. Uh -huh. All of Bob's friends back then pretty much go back to the social clubs and places they all hung out at back then. 
Deanna Young was a bartender at the American Legion where Bob went all the time. Sometimes he would come in and would just be quiet, and then the next time he would come in, he would get drunk and carry on and on and on and talk and talk when he was angry and bitter. He was just a man in a bar drinking, trying to get over his woman problems. I've seen that a lot. I'm going to jog your memory. And you tell me that several times he went past her house two or three times to look and see whose car was there. This is true. It was around the time that he told me that he was thinking about committing suicide. He said he had a gun just sitting there loaded up to his head. So Bob told you that? Sounds kind of bad. I just remember sitting in the truck with him and he said something about if he found him, he was going to shoot him. What did you think when he said that? I just thought, you know, he was upset because uh, he still loved her. Bob's anger and jealousy about the divorce were very strong motives, but we also need to know what he was thinking on the night of the murder. One of the few people who did see Bob that night was the person Bob had the blind date with, who Patty Burton set up, whose name was Dana. How did you know Patty? I took care of her husband. Okay. I was a nurse at Good Sam at okay. that time. Okay. So she arranges a date with Bob Steffen, right? And I told her I would go if she went along, so she went along with us. He didn't say a whole lot. Patty talked a lot more than he did. Okay. We went to Ginghamsburg Church. We also went to the barn for just a little bit, and then I had to come home because I was working the next day. So the last time you see Bob, it's about 8, 30, 9 o'clock, and he's driving off with Patty. Right. What Bob did when that blind date ended is one of the biggest mysteries in this case. I left Patty's house approximately 8.30. I drove by Jim's house on the way into town. Didn't see a car there once I went around the block and went out to the Legion. And then he left and went out to see if his brother was home, and then he just meandered back home to his house down back country roads. When you look at it, it's not really an alibi at all. We need to know where he was. But the only time he did anything with the witness was at the bar. The question would be when he's talking to our bartender for those two hours where he's drinking and... David well, Lerner is uh, passed away. Who's David Lerner? He was a bartender. Uh, no, no, he's not the bartender that yeah, night. He is. That's bad. Without that bartender, we do not have anyone that can tell us what Bob was thinking and how he was acting in the hours preceding the murder. Can you think of another way to get around that? There's other bartenders. That night? No. We need that night because this sets the scenario for the cascading of dominoes. That might have been it. Man, that's... Oh, wow. Our investigation of Bob Steffen has stalled. This is Derek Fell. Hi. Hi. Nice me. to meet you. But there is another witness. Where do you want me? Right there in the orange chair. All right. An informant who came forward several years ago after a conversation with Patty Burton. I didn't know anything about the murders. I didn't know anything about these people. So who's all there that night when that... It was Scott, me, and Patty. Is that the first time you met Patty? It was. I was warned about her prior to meeting her. How was you warned? I was told to avoid her, and she was the one that killed these people. And I didn't believe it. But then when I actually met her, she came over, we was all sitting around smoking weed, and the conversation came up, and I was like, no, you're just joking, like, whatever. And she goes, no, I did it, and that bitch got she deserved. And you're talking about the murders of mm -hmm. Dennis and... Yeah, I, I remember that coming out of the conversation and the fact that she was adamant about doing it. And I believed it when it came out of her mouth. I don't know why you would say you were behind a murder. Why would Patty put herself in the middle of this? It doesn't make any sense. Maybe the other witness who was with our informant that same night can shed some light on this. There's Scott, I think. Go have me contact. You Scott? All right. Patty would have been your what? She was married to my uncle. John. Okay. Do you remember ever being in a conversation and Patty starts to make some disclosures about this homicide? Patty insinuated she did it, but she never said she did it. Basically, all that was really said was 
You know how it is, Scott. She just said, if you want something done, do it yourself. If you want that could have been a reference to Bob, too, right? If she'd known Bob did it, does that make sense to you? I don't, I never heard no reference to Bob. I know Patty liked him an awful lot, but I don't remember any reference to Bob any of the times we talked about the killings. Scott's statement doesn't exactly match, but there's no reason why our informant would make all this up. Hopefully we'll find her in a condition that she can talk. The problem is there's no real true motive for why Patty would kill Kim and Denny, who never did anything to her. Maybe if we can surprise Patty at her house, we can catch her off guard and get some final true answers. See, that house right there is her, so I was hoping this drive right here, maybe. Yeah, nobody meeting us with guns in our hands so far, all right? I went to church Sunday, so if we go to meet the maker, I'll say a prayer for you. Yeah. That house right over there is hers? Yeah. How you doing, you Patty? Wonder if you had some time to talk with us here today. Really, there ain't nothing I can tell you. They've tried to interview Patty on numerous occasions, and she becomes very defensive. Here, we need just some small details. We just want to go over the story. Can we just can we go in the car and sit down and talk? Because I got to look at my notes. Great to have a seat up in front of the car there. It's a nice car, nice and comfortable. Our strategy was basically to be very friendly to her and get her into the car and talk to her. What do you want to have? I ain't got nothing to hide. They got her in the car. I heard that your car was at Lori's, and she said, did you know that the police want to talk to me? Uh-oh. Do you ever remember being in a house with Scott? And maybe you were talking a little bit about this incident? Would you have ever made a comment that maybe, A, she got what she deserved, being Kim? No. You wouldn't have said that? No. And, B, maybe that... If you do this, do it by yourself? No. Let me ask you this, okay? Yeah. Would you have ever said, maybe it's the marijuana talking, that you were involved with this murder? No. Okay. Scott Myers is a f liar. It could be. I'm not saying he's he's honest. Okay? He's not. And that's why we're coming to talking to you. Just clear, so just clear some stuff, stuff okay? up here, okay? He's the one that started all this. Okay. How did you meet Bob? I met Bob at the Eagles. At the Eagles. Found out they did a little handyman jobs. What'd you think of Kim? I thought she was a little bit flighty because of her relationship with Denny. So you meet Bob in the process of being divorced, right? And then you set him up with Dana. Yeah. yeah. He said, all I want in my life, he says, is a good, decent woman that won't run around on me. And he said, do you know anybody? I said, actually, I do. Me and him smoked a joint. And so I fixed him up with Dana. Bob comes over here because Dana doesn't want to go by herself, right? Is that how this night starts off? No, I think I don't. I think I don't know if he picked her up at her house. They didn't go in my car. I didn't go. No, did Dana? Because I thought Dana was a little bit apprehensive about going by herself. All I can tell you is that they went out. Did you go with him to church? No. Did you go to eat with him later? No. You didn't? No, they went. She did go with him, right? Yeah. Well, this is crazy. So is she trying to act like the night never happened? Did you go with him to church? No. Did you go to eat with him later? No. You didn't? No, they went. She did go with him, right? Yeah. Well, this is crazy. So is she trying to act like the night never happened? Both Dana and Bob say that Patty was on that blind date, so I don't know if Patty's lying about that or she just really doesn't remember. So, Bob, does he come back here? Do you remember that after the date? I think we talked about it later. We probably smoked pot. After the date? Probably. Okay. And he probably said, Patty, you fixed me up with a nine. Were you ever romantically? No, never. I didn't want him. Ellie is close to my son's age. Yeah, I understand that. Really, I shouldn't even be talking to you. Sure you should. We need your help. Do you understand that? Yeah, I understand that. They ain't I'm nothing not I can help you with. I don't know no more than you know. I met Bob at the Eagles. I smoked a little bit of pot with him, and that's as far as it went. Period. Mm -hmm. Period. Mm -hmm. That flat out wore me out. You know, I just don't think she's got the you mental. Never, you can never keep yeah, her on track yeah. to save your life. What'd you think? 
I think she smoked so much dope, she doesn't know what the truth is. I think she's trying to pull herself away from the whole thing. This incident with the date, I don't know why she'd lie about it. Is she a party? Is she a co-defendant? Because that interview doesn't help us. I don't know if she has knowledge, if she's minimizing, or she's just smoking dope so much her brain is fried. Talking to Patty really wasn't very helpful, and we have nothing else concrete to show that she was involved in these murders. Our concern is that every moment we spend trying to figure out if Patty's involved takes away our focus on whether or not Bob had anything to do with this. So there's a case with Patty. Maybe Bob Steffen will say something on her. How you do Bob? You could bring him in? I would not go to his house. I'm telling you that flat out. Why? There's no bad? way I'm gonna pull in that driveway. Do no you think way. calling him and you think he's going to come in from calling him? I don't know. Heck no. But my whole point is, he, he knows we're in town. He knows what we're driving as soon as he's pulling that driveway. You think he'll start shooting? It feels like we've talked to everyone in this whole dang town. But until we figure out how to approach Bob, we have to talk to every witness and look for any little piece that we might have missed to see if he was involved or not. And if he was, how was he involved? Did we talk to the landlord? Is he still alive? Forrest Pittman? Yeah. He's alive. Eric, I'm looking at my old notes. Once upon a time, Eric said that Kim came crying to the to landlord. Him, to, that she needed a place to live. she needed a place to live. We need to add Forrest Pittman to the list. Is uh, Forrest Pittman live there still? Yeah, he does. Forrest? Yes. Are you familiar with Bob and Kim Steffen? Yes, I knew them very well. He was my handyman. If if I needed something repaired at one of the properties, I called him. He did a good job for me when I needed the job done. One day, Kim came to my office and she told me she needed a rental place because she was leaving him. I put her in this house and uh, she was living there when you this know, happened. This happened. After Kim filed for divorce, she rented a house from Forrest Pittman where she lived right up until the time of the murders. What's interesting is that Bob was the handyman for Forrest. When I was getting that house ready to rent, after this all came down in the furnace room, the outside vent from the furnace was disconnected. The gases that should be going outside were not. This wasn't something that was an accident, you know. Somebody had taken that off. I suspected that Bob Stefflins had probably disconnected that to try to fixate her and her children. Uh, you know. No one had rented it in between murder and when you discover this. Well, I, you know, I wasn't allowed to, you know. Normally, a burning furnace creates carbon monoxide which travels through the flue into the chimney and out the house. When the flue is separated, as Forrest describes, that carbon monoxide would escape the furnace, filling a small home to lethal levels very quickly. You've been very, very, very helpful, sir. Thank you so much. Excellent. Don't you think? I think it's very, very good. You know what else is good about that, Eric? It's something your DA has never heard. Nope. Do you realize how big this is? After interviewing all the witnesses in this case, the only person left to question is Bob Steffen. It seems like it might be too dangerous to try and approach him face to face, but talking to him could be crucial, so we have to try. Hi, Bob. Yeah? My name is Steve Spangola, and I'm up here working with the Greenville, Ohio Police Department, taking a look at a cold case that involved your ex-wife. Would you be willing to sit down, sir, and talk to me a little bit about this case? Bob? Hello? Might be hung up. Is it still ticking? Yeah, he hung up. Can I try it again? Yeah. I think that was a no. What do you think, Eric? I think that was about as big a no as you can get. Wow. What are y'all's thoughts now on whether or not Patty Burton should still be on the suspect board? 
I don't believe she did this. I think she may have said crazy statements at times, but I don't think she was a key player in it at all. Steve? She doesn't have the skill set to commit this. Between inconsistencies about what Patty said about the murders, Patty's state of mind, and the fact that there is no physical evidence linking Patty to the murders, not only is there not really a strong case against Patty, there is no case at all. Look at this board with all the things against Bob, Stefan. All these people have little pieces of the story to add to our case. The evidence shows that Bob Steffen was abusive to both Kim and her boys and even reportedly made threats with firearms. She talked about the bruises and being slapped around. Bob had a motive. When Kim left him, he was enraged and jealous. And according to our witnesses, there were threats being made. He's waving a gun around, telling her he's going to kill her and her kids if she leaves. Bob has no alibi, and he even admitted to driving by Kim's home that night. And finally, we have evidence that Kim's furnace was tampered with in the days before the murder. The same apartment where Bob served as the handyman. In this case, it feels like a very intelligent killer methodically cut the phone lines and was lying in wait for Kim and Dennis. Are you ready to take it to your DA? As excited as I've ever been on it. We wish y'all luck. The next day, Eric and Eric and I spend the morning meeting with the DA. He listens to everything, all the evidence and all the statements to help make the decision. Now it's time to tell the family what he's decided. You know what you're going to tell him, Eric? Yes. Before we tell what the DA has decided, there is something we need to address. This time, Denny's son, Dennis, is joining us. Like some of the other people in town, we've heard that he also suspects Jackie and Jamie in these murders. So we just want to talk to him before the boys show up because we want him to spread the word that they had absolutely nothing to do with this. Hi, Hi. Eric. How are we doing? Good. Hi, Yolanda. Hi, how are you? Hi. I'm wonderful. How are you? Good, good. Thank you. Okay. It has been a long several days. Just on this side, there's been, been accusations. Why aren't we looking at the boys? The crime scene is very sophisticated and really thought out. Not what a 12 or 15 year old would do. It would be so sloppy. Yeah. Those boys would have wanted to kill Bob, not their own mother. And certainly not Dennis. Right. Out of the 16 pages that we presented to the prosecutor, there's no evidence at all that a child committed this crime. So if y'all hear that from your people anymore, tell them to stop. It's oh, yeah, ridiculous. Yes, I don't believe that okay? at all. Yeah, I don't it's believe ridiculous. that at all. Yeah. So they're downstairs waiting to hear, just like y'all are. These boys have been through so much in their lifetime, and can you imagine how good it feels for Eric to be able to share with them what has happened? Come have a seat. We presented what we found to Kelly Ornsby. He is more optimistic than I've ever seen him before, and as expected, I, I knew that he was not going to give an immediate response. He's going to review what we have. He said to tell you he is encouraged. He just wants to read it all so he knows it like Eric does. It's the furthest progress it's ever been in all these years. The only thing I would tell you all is once he's read it all in a couple of weeks, all of you need to pick up the phone and call him and tell him you're waiting to hear. You're waiting to hear. You're waiting to hear. Did you guys talk to Bob? He tried. <laughs> tried. He's not a good man at all. No. We lived with him for long enough to tell. Joy, you OK? Yeah. What are you thinking? I'm okay. You okay? It's That's a good cry, right? Yeah. It's a good cry. Okay. Because it's all good. Hey guys. Yeah. I'm Dennis. Yeah. So last time I met you guys, you were 12 and 15. Yeah. So it's been a long time. Nice long time to see you. Yeah. I see you guys growing up well, huh? Yeah. I want to see resolve. You know, everyone does, and something like this. And I know there will be resolved someday. Somehow there will be resolved. Be patient just a little bit longer, okay? okay. Call, call in about 10 days, you call the DA, okay? This is the first time in 17 years there's been actual hope. I mean, it's been so long, I just kind of thought it, nothing was really even going to happen and completely changed my outlook after today. Maybe we'll see each other again shortly. Oh, I'm sure we will. <laughs> we hope the DA will move forward with this case very soon. Until then, we hope that all the hard work that Eric and his team have done for the last 17 years will provide them the peace and unity that their families need to keep going.
Don't miss an all-new Cold Justice next Friday at 8 on TNT.